Welcome, and thank you for joining me as we walk through the book of Acts. Uh, today's story gets rather interesting and intense, and so let's get right into it. I've entitled this lesson, It's Good to be Roman, and as we read through the text, you'll see where I got the title from. Now remember, in the last lesson, Paul is, is, uh, has just been rescued from a riot in the temple courts, and he gives a speech. He starts speaking in the Hebrew language, and everyone starts listening to him right up until he said, uh, God has decided to send me to the Gentiles. Now, for the Jews there, that was too much. Uh, they, they, in fact, one of his ac the accusations was that Paul had brought a Gentile into the temple and therefore defiled it. And so we pick the story up just as he says, God has sent me away to the Gentiles. Up to this word, they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks saying that he should be examined by flogging to find out why they were shouting against him like that. Can you imagine this scene? Throwing their cloaks off, flinging dust into the air. The Romans were probably very, very confused. Let's continue. But when they had stretched him out for the whips, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, Is it lawful for you to flog a man? who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said to them, said to him, What are you about to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. So the tribune came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, Yes. The tribune answered, I bought this citizenship for a large sum. Paul said, and I, I have to admit, you almost, uh, you can almost hear a little snootiness here, a little, uh, a little attitude from Paul when he says, "But I am a citizen by birth." Those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately, and the tribune was also afraid, for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. But on the next day, desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews. He unbound him and commanded the chief priests and all the council to meet, and he brought Paul down and set him before them. And looking intently at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest, Ananias, commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law, and yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck? Those who stood by said, would, would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Now, when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other part were Pharisees, he cried out to the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of a Pharisee. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. When he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge all of them. And when a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply, we find nothing wrong with this man. What if a spirit or an angel has spoke to him? And when the dissension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from among them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, whereas you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. 
Quite an interesting little story that we pick up here. There's a lot going on between the Jewish law and the Roman law, and uh, let's, let's break it down. Paul asks, is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? Now, that was a rhetorical question. The fact is, it was not legal, and every Roman soldier knew that. Roman law, and we've discussed this in other stories, said that uh, if, you, if you flogged a Roman citizen without him being condemned, then he had the right to have you flogged. Whoever, whoever was engaged in his punishment, uh, he got to turn that punishment around on them. And they all knew that. So here they're about to flog him, and he says, is it lawful? And they, they know, oh, whoa, this is, this is a problem. We can't flog a Roman citizen until he's been condemned. Now, it is interesting. I find it interesting. If you remember back to the story when Paul was in Philippi, they dragged him in and they flogged him. And it was only after he had been flogged that he revealed to the leaders there that he was a Roman citizen. Now, why would Paul let himself be flogged in Philippi? But in this instance, he quickly points out he's a Roman citizen before they flog him. Now, what I think is, by allowing them to flog him in Philippi, Paul had something he could hold over the rulers of that city. They all knew that since they had flogged a Roman citizen, he had the right to have them flogged. And the fact that he didn't made them a little more open to being nice to the people he had converted to Christianity. It made, it made the rulers of the city a little less likely to persecute the Christians there. In this case, he had nothing to gain by letting himself be flogged, and uh, everything to gain by not allowing it, actually standing under the protection of Roman law. It's an interesting twist. Now we deal with the Mosaic Law. The, the Tribune still can't figure out what's going on. A whole riot was started. People were screaming, yelling. He thinks Paul has to be guilty of something for the, for the Jews to react this way. So uh, instead of the mob that was out in front of the uh, barracks, he would take them to the ruling council, the leading men of Israel, the Sanhedrin, the priests. Surely uh, they could have a civil discussion there. So Paul once again opens up and says, hey, I've lived my life. A Clint with a clear conscience before God, and before he can even continue, the high priest commands that those who stood by him strike him. He was immediately punished. The reaction was instantaneous. Someone struck Paul immediately, and uh, Paul got a little upset because that actually goes against the Mosaic law. Deuteronomy 25, 1 through 3 clearly states that, that any judge, the high priest or any other judge, could not order someone to be beaten could not order someone to be punished physically unless a guilty verdict had been reached. And so Paul quickly rebukes whoever commanded this guy to hit him because it goes against the law. He points that out very quickly. God will strike you because you've gone against the law. Paul cursed him. He didn't know who had said it. I'm guessing it's because his eyesight was poor that he did not recognize that it was the high priest. Uh, but he just knew someone ordered him to be struck, and he was struck, and that goes against the law. So Paul immediately curses him, says, God will, will strike you for breaking the law. And then someone says, hey, you, you're talking to the high priest. And Paul immediately reverses course. He backpedals. He says, I didn't know, brothers. For it's written, you shall not speak evil of the ruler of your people. Once again, Paul's affirming his respect for the law. And I have a feeling, you know, between the lines there is, but the high priest obviously does not respect the law. Paul seems to be pointing out, I, I'm showing more respect for the law than the high priest. It sort of turns it into a kangaroo court. And, uh, and Paul knows it. So this passage I call Working the Jury. Paul knows the audience. It's the Sanhedrin. It's made up of elders of the city. It's made up of the priests. And it's also made up of Pharisees. So there's sort of three groups in here. And he's very well aware of a particular difference between Sadducees and Pharisees. 
that the, the Pharisees believe in the resurrection of the dead, but the Sadducees do not. And so Paul decides he's going to have to take matters into his own hands here. He realized the verdict was already guilty when he showed up. And so he had to work the crowd here. Now, when he perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other were Pharisees, he cried out to the council, Brothers, I'm a Pharisee, the son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. Now, that's not the whole truth, uh, but it's mostly true. He's on trial because he's a Christian. He's on trial because he believes Jesus was, is the Christ and that he did, in fact, rise from the dead, and that he was, in fact, our living Savior. And so he cries out in the middle of this thing, picking up on a very old fight between these two groups of people. And I, I find it kind of funny that uh, these, are the, these are the leading men of the city. These are the aristocracy. These are the, the priests, the Pharisees, the religious zealots. You would expect that that you would have civil discourse within this group of people. I imagine that's what the tribune of the Romans thought. But instead, even amongst the leading aristocracy, a riot breaks out right there in the high council's meeting among the Sanhedrin. And uh, it just gets completely out of hand, so much so that uh, the tribune has to step in. When the dissension became violent, the tribune afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces, commanded his soldiers to take, go down and get him out of there and take him by force back to the protection of the barracks. I mean, th these are the rulers. The, you sort of can see why the Romans thought the Jews were crazy. These people are not, this is supposed to be the civil authority. This is supposed to be the, the religious, those who are pious. And yet they're about to tear Paul to pieces, to pieces over their own theological differences. And so the Roman tribune has to go in. Now, here again, I say, it's good to be Roman because uh, the Romans had a habit of letting Jews kill Jews if, if it was just a problem between the Jews. Uh, people were sto still stoned to death on a regular basis. Uh, the Jewish high court could punish, imprison, beat people. Um, that the, and the Romans typically turned a blind eye. In this particular instance, because he knows Paul is a Roman citizen, uh, the tribune goes in and rescues him. But I, I, I have a feeling if he hadn't been a Roman citizen, the tribune might have let them tear him to pieces. So definitely, in this case, it was good to be Roman on Paul's part. Luke also seems to be telling this story in a way that shows that the Romans— have more respect for their law than the San Sanhedrin had for theirs. I think all through Acts, if you pay attention, Luke is uh, makes the Roman government and the Roman law look pretty good. And I think that's partly because he's writing Luke and Acts in hopes of gaining sympathy as sort of an, uh, an explanation of Christianity to the Roman government. And he points out on several occasions where the councils and rulers of Rome said this is not, Christianity is fine. And so here again, Luke sort of makes the Romans look good and the Jewish Sanhedrin not so good. But the question throughout all of this is who's in charge? I mean, twice in two days, Paul has nearly been torn apart by a violent Jewish mob. Why? It's for being a Christian for being famous for having persecuted Christians and then changed his allegiance to follow Jesus Christ and testify about Jesus Christ. His testimony was powerful. When Paul told his story, many hated him, many converted. Many saw Paul's life and, and became Christians themselves. We, we read in uh, Acts chapter 15 that there was a large group of Pharisees who had become Christians. And so you, ha you, ha you see Paul here getting almost torn to pieces, and you wonder, is God taking care of Paul? Paul's going to be his witness. Um, is God really, uh, you know, looking out for Paul, or, you know, did he kind of let these two slip through? Well, if you remember back to Paul's conversion, he's told 
Oh, and Paul, uh, God talks to uh, Ananias, uh, the, the one who converts him, and he, he says, I, I will show Paul how much he's going to suffer for my sake. That Paul had indeed persecuted Christians, and Paul was going to be persecuted as a Christian. But that didn't mean God had abandoned him. That just means God had appointed Paul to have a special testimony because of even these violent attempts to kill him. And we read later where Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not abandoned. Persecuted, but not destroyed. Struck down. And Paul knows what's coming. And he stands up knowing God is going to be with him anyway. It also appears that these corrupt Roman soldiers, they were known for their corruption, were were to be more trusted than the religious leaders of the Jews. I think Luke is pressing that point, uh, trying to trying to be sympathetic or gain an understanding ear from the Roman government. And I think this is this is where we need to find out who's in charge. It says after all these two days of trials, and Paul's got some more interesting travel times with people trying to kill him coming up. But it says the following night, the Lord, Jesus Christ, stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. The, 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 our Lord and Savior is telling Paul, I'm going to take you from the capital of Israel, the capital of Judea, to the capital of, of the whole Roman Empire. You're going to testify me before uh, the Caesar and uh, the Roman officials. And there's a long, there's going to be a long period in between where he's going to get a chance to share his story more and more. And, and he's telling Paul, hey, take courage. And it takes courage. And remember, courage is not the lack of fear. Courage is acting in the face of fear. And Paul's just nearly been attacked and mobbed twice, but Jesus is letting him know, I'm going to walk you through this. And we're going to take it all the way to Rome. So what's the, what's the call to action in all of this? It's, a, it's an interesting story. It's got a lot of intrigue going on, a lot of legalities back and forth. How does, what do we get out of this story that, that uh, helps us live a better life right now today? Well, I think one of the lessons here, and I think it's pretty clear, no matter how violent pagan, secular, atheistic, liberal, progressive, far right, far left, what, whichever way you categorize your audience. Maybe hostile. We're still called to tell our story. How has Jesus made my life better as a result of following him? What, what's the standard that, 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 that changes us, transforms us by being Christians? How does that make us better people? How does that make us a better community? And what sort of hope does that give to the, the dark and hopeless world around us? We are called to tell our story no matter what's going on, no matter who the audience is, and then leave the rest to God. Because if we do our part, God is faithful and he will do his part. And sometimes we don't always agree with the way he's doing his part. Sometimes that's, uh, that's questionable. But the fact of the matter is God is in charge and he can be trusted. He loves us. He cares for us. He has a purpose for us. He is what gives our life meaning. And so we need to trust him and do our part. Tell our story. Talk about what Jesus has done to transform our lives. And then leave the rest to God. We should not fear rejection. We should not fear persecution or even death. And even if those things come and some fear comes along with it, we need to have the courage to step up and do what God's called us because God is in charge. And he's told us he's going to be with us. He's going to protect us all the way right into heaven, right through this life, through death, and into his eternal presence. And knowing we can trust him for that, we are capable of doing incredible things 
by his power, by the guidance of his Holy Spirit. And like the last verse in this text, we need to also take courage because the Lord Jesus Christ will stand near us. He, he'll be right there with us all the way. Sometimes when, when things are going wrong, we sort of think, oh, Jesus has abandoned me. No, that's, that's when you're hurting. That's when he's the closest to you. That's when you should feel his hand on, on our shoulders because that's when he draws near to give us the strength to give us the wisdom, to give us the courage to do what he's called us to do so that his name will be glorified. Thank you for joining with me today.